Underwood and Flinch by Mike Bannett Read by the author Copyright Mike Bannett 2008 to 2012 For more information, please visit www.underwoodandflinch.com Episode 1 Prologue Spain, 1958 Flinch looked in the rearview mirror and saw headlights, their distant beams slivering over the surface of the coffin like moonlight on water. Then a third red light began pulsing above the headlights, and the trill ringing of a siren started. "'We seem to have attracted the attention of the authorities, sir.' For a moment there was no answer. Then a low, muffled voice came from the back of the hearse. Drive on, Flinch. Very good, your lordship. Should I attempt evasive action? But for the noise from the siren, the hearse was silent. Then the lid of the coffin slid aside, and Underwood sat up and looked out of the back window. Where are we? "'About thirty miles he'd led from Balaga, sir.' Underwood looked around, out into the night. Eh, "'Not much chance of losing them in this countryside. "'What is all that out there?' "'Olive groves.' "'Oh, how nice. "'Perhaps I could attempt to outrun them.' "'No, don't bother, Flinch.' Underwood looked back at the pursuing vehicle, then turned to address Flinch in the rear-view mirror. Actually, I'm feeling rather peckish, and it's been so long since I had a drop of Spanish. What say we stop and see what they want? Do you have your gun? Flinch opened the glove compartment and took out the Luger. He slipped it under the black top hat beside him on the passenger seat. I do, sir. Right. Underwood lay down in the coffin and settled himself. Pull over, Flinch. Tell them you're British. Even Franco's fascist coppers should respect that and let you go about your business. And if they don't, well, they'll jolly well regret it, won't they? He reached up and pulled the coffin lid closed on top of him. Yes, sir. Flinch slowed the car and pulled up on the side of the road. He waited, watching as the lights of the pursuing car drew nearer. The siren fell silent and the car rolled up behind them. Two figures got out. In the glow from his rear lights, Flinch recognised the strange, boxy headwear of the civil guard. The men unbuttoned their holsters and drew their guns. Flinch took his passport and travel documents from the glove compartment and wound down the driver's window. Hola, senor! The guards glanced at him and paced around the hearse, eyeing it suspiciously. Then one of them barked a command in Spanish. Salga del coche! Uh, oh, sorry, senor. Uh, no comprendo mucho espanol. From inside the coffin, Underwood spoke, his voice muffled by the lid. He wants you to get out, Flinch. Don't disappoint him. He sounds awfully miffed. Flinch opened the door and got out, his hands raised. Uh, oh, pardon me, said yours. The guards looked at him as if he was something that someone had carelessly trodden into their carpet. One of them, the taller of the two, reached out and gestured for Flinch to hand over his documents. Flinch did so. Hmm, Inglés, you not speak Spanish? Uh, no, sir. I'm here on business. Huh? What is your business? Flinch cocked a thumb at the black Rolls Royce wraith beside him. I'm an undertaker. I've been hired to deliver the body of a Spanish gentleman to his family estate. Huh? Undertaker? Uh, yes. D dead people. Uh, my business is, uh, uh, dead people. The guard smiled. Huh? My business too, sometimes. He liked the joke and repeated it for his friend in Spanish. The other guard chuckled and tried the handle of the hearse's rear door. It was locked. He spoke to Flinch in rapid Spanish. Flinch's face was a picture of bewilderment. The tall guard translated the order. 
Open the car and take out the box. Oh, but, senor, por favor, uh, the casket is... Flinch's protest was cut off by a backhanded blow across the face. Open the car, now! Flinch wiped his mouth. It came away dark with blood. He looked at the guard evenly for a moment before bowing his head. Then he reached in through the driver's door and took the keys from the ignition. He held up the keys to show them he wasn't holding a weapon, then walked around to the back of the hearse and unlocked the single heavy door. He pulled it open, then stood back. The guards looked in at what to them was an incredibly expensive coffin. Hmm. Okay, take out the box, said the tall guard. Flinch hesitated for a second, then replied, uh, oh, Well, you'll have to help me, said yours. It's very heavy. The guards exchanged a few words in Spanish, then the shorter of the two went around to the opposite side of the coffin to Flinch and took one of the coffin handles. He motioned at Flinch to do likewise. Flinch obeyed. The tall guard took a few steps back and aimed his gun at Flinch's head. The shorter guard looked at Flinch and nodded. Uno, dos, tres. They pulled, and the coffin slid out, foot end first. When it was halfway clear of the back of the hearse, the shorter guard grunted an incomprehensible command and began to lower the coffin down to the ground. Flinch followed suit. Now, open it, said the tall guard. The moon found a break in the cloud and spilled silver-grey light over the scene. Oh, really, said yours, I can't imagine what you think I might be hiding in there. There's only a body. Open it, box! The guard shouted and pointed his pistol into Flinch's face. Flinch bowed and then came around so his back was to the guards, both of whom were now aiming their guns at him. Flinch smiled and lifted the lid from the coffin. The tall guard grimaced. Inside the coffin was the body of a man whom he estimated could have been aged anything between thirty and forty. It was difficult to tell when they had been dead for a while. The cheeks were sunken, as were the closed eyes which were barely visible under the shadow of the man's brow, and the skin, typical of a cadaver, was the colour of white ash. It seemed almost aglow in the light of the moon. The guard admired the corpse's suit. It was expensive, black, and, more or less, the same size as his. Flinch cleared his throat. Uh, "'Gentlemen, may I present the late Senor Underwood?' The shorter guard stepped forward, aimed his pistol at the corpse's chest, and fired. The body rocked with the bullet's impact. "'Gentlemen, please!' Flinch began to protest. "'You want to go into the box also?' snapped the tall guard. Flinch raised his hands and lowered his head. The short guard walked up to the coffin and began to feel the lapel of Underwood's suit. He said something to his partner in Spanish. <laughs> See, the tall guard chuckled. He was about to add something when, suddenly, the body in the coffin opened its eyes. Well, it was a nice suit, said Underwood, until you went and put a bullet hole in it. The guard managed to utter a syllable of disbelief before Underwood yanked him forwards as if to embrace him. The guard struggled, hands flailing, trying to fight but unable to get a blow to connect due to the sides of the coffin. Stop! shouted the tall guard, trying to get a clear shot. Stop! Uh, uh. The order froze on his lips as Underwood suddenly sank his teeth into the short guard's neck. The tall guard stepped back, away from his partner's screams. Dios mio! He fired a shot without thinking and cried out when he saw it had hit his partner in the left shoulder blade. The bullet passed through the short guard and hit Underwood in the chest. Underwood's eyes flashed up and saw the tall guard trying to aim despite wildly trembling hands. 
Underwood fixed the guard with a stare, savouring his terror for a few moments, before releasing him with a friendly wink. <gasps> El Diablo! The tall guard fired again, repeatedly, no longer caring whether he hit his partner or not, which was just as well because he did. Lo siento, Carlos! Lo siento! He was about to fire again when Underwood raised his face from the still pumping wound and shouted, Flinch! For God's sake, man, what am I paying you for? The tall guard had a clear shot at Underwood's head. He held his breath, aimed, but then another gun fired. The tall guard's head snapped back as a bullet from Flinch's Luger hit him just above the right eye. He toppled over backwards, dead. Sorry, sir, said Flinch. I had to go around the front of the car to get my gun. Yes, yes, well, never mind. Underwood positioned his mouth over the wound and resumed drinking. Uh, uh, shall I get you a cloth, sir? said Flinch, walking around to the passenger door. Uh, we've got no napkins, of course, but uh, I believe I may have a clean shabby somewhere. He listened for a reply, but there was none, save the gurgle of blood in the throat of the dying guard. Flinch sighed and looked at his watch. He sat down in the passenger seat and took out his cigarettes. He lit one and pushed the door open wider so as to get a better view of the moonlit landscape. It was a lovely night, cloudy but warm. From behind him, came the sound of a body falling to the road. Flinch? Uh, yes, sir. Where's that cloth? I've got this bastard all over me. Sorry, sir. I was just enjoying the night. Underwood came around the side of the hearse. The blood that covered his chin and clothes glistened black in the moonlight. Oh, yes. Yes, it is nice, isn't it? Still... Time waits for no man, old chap. You've got to get going. Flinch got up and handed Underwood a cloth. Oh, this is dirty. Don't you have a clean one? I'm sorry, sir. I haven't had a chance to do any washing these past few days. You are a clod, Flinch. Underwood took the cloth and wiped his face and hands. Yes, sir. Very sorry, sir. Will you be getting back in the casket or driving up front with me? Neither. I mean, look at me, Flinch. This suit's utterly ruined. He ripped his shirt and waistcoat open and pointed to the bullet wounds on his chest. The black holes had stopped bleeding and already begun to heal. Look where that bloody fascist shot me. Not a very nice welcome, sir. No, indeed, said Underwood, kicking off his shoes. He picked them up and inspected them. Well, these are all right, though. Nothing a spot of spit and polish won't take care of. He handed them to Flinch. Yes, sir. I'll have them looking as good as new before tomorrow evening. Not that I'll be needing them tomorrow evening, but uh, still, good show, Flinch. Would you like me to take the suit, sir? No, it's had it, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's soaked up more claret than your grandfather used to at Christmas. Oh, dear. But uh, here. Underwood removed his cufflinks and took out his watch. He unhooked it from his waistcoat and handed it and the cufflinks to Flinch. Take these, would you? Flinch took them. Of course, sir. He slipped them into his pocket. Now, are you sure you know the way? Yes, sir. I have my map and directions. Good. I'm going to have to go on ahead. It'll be light soon and I want to get in and smarten up before the sun rises. Yes, sir. Very good, sir. Well, so I'll uh, see you in a bit then. Underwood made a shooing motion at Flinch. You'd better get back. I know the suit's wet, but it'll still go up. Flinch nodded and took a few steps back. Even though he had seen Underwood's transformation process perhaps a thousand times, the sight still filled him with awe, and he felt a thrill of anticipation run through him. Righto then, Flinch. Underwood grinned. Carry on. Flinch watched 
as Underwood dropped into a crouch, and then sprang upwards, launching himself into the night as the miracle that always made Flinch want to simultaneously weep and applaud happened again. Underwood's body lost its corporeal form, disintegrating into what the superstitious peasants of Eastern Europe had once believed to be smoke, a dense cloud of blood-red molecules, Underwood's molecules swirled up and away from the road. The intense heat generated by his molecular destabilization caused Underwood's clothes to burst into flames and fall away from him in blazing ruins as, still rising, the vampire began to take his new form. Flinch raised a hand to shield his eyes as tatters of burning clothing fell around him. Then he looked up into the sky to where Underwood, phoenix-like, with smoke and burning embers still trailing in his wake, spread his black wings against the cloud-shrouded moon. The bat beat its wings, and even though it was perhaps twenty feet overhead, there came a strong downrush of air that fanned the flames below and caused Flinch to stagger amidst the whirling eddies of ashes and embers. When he looked up again, his master had gone. He laughed. <laughs> Oh, there goes another Savile Row suit. I don't know. Some people have got money to burn, all right. He shook his head and walked over to kick around among the burning scraps. As always, there was nothing left to identify the clothes or their owner. He walked around to the back of the hearse and looked down at the guard that Underwood had been feeding on. He bent to feel for a pulse. The guard was alive. His pulse was faint, but it was there. Flinch straightened up, drew the luger from the waistband of his trousers, and shot the guard twice in the neck where Underwood had bitten him, and once, for certainty's sake, in the head. Then he replaced the lid on the coffin before easing it back into the hearse and slamming the door. He turned to the dead guards that lay sprawled in the light from the headlights of their car. Adios, amigos. He gave them a friendly salute, and, a few moments later, left them lying under a fine cloud of dust and exhaust. Flinch saw the distant lights of the farmhouse from miles away. At first he thought it was a star, low in the sky, just another light in the pitch-black country night. But as he grew nearer, the light grew larger, becoming a small cluster, and then distinct individual lights. Now he could see the shape of the building against the hills and trees that surrounded it, he felt a mingled sense of sadness and trepidation as he approached the gates. He was forty-seven years old, and had been Underwood's guardian for twenty years, succeeding to the role after his father retired back in 1938. What a time for the old man to retire, the eve of the Second World War. The war had been a ferocious and terrible time, but what adventures he and his master had had together. And now, here he was, rolling towards his own retirement, much earlier than his father had done, and much earlier than he himself had ever expected to. He'd never thought of himself as being a farmer, not least an olive farmer, but when his lordship had informed him of his wish to lay himself to rest, they'd had to decide where that resting place should be. All the allied western countries were becoming increasingly difficult to keep a low profile in. It really came down to Africa, Spain, or possibly Italy. However, his lordship was uncomfortable with Italy's proximity to the eastern bloc countries, and since it had a thriving communist party of its own, he had felt it best to steer clear of it for now. Underwood didn't want to wake up under communism, so of the remaining two, 
Flinch by far preferred Spain. Underwood had accepted his decision and they'd made the necessary arrangements to procure this remote farmhouse deep in the countryside of Europe's only remaining fascist dictatorship. Much as Flinch disliked the idea of being in a fascist state, the sect was strong here and he had no fear of being interfered with. Though obviously their earlier run-in with the law meant that word had yet to filter down to the lower ranks of the civil guard, but these things took time. The Spanish house had seemed perfect. It was surrounded by olive groves for miles around. The groves had come with the land, and Flinch had arranged for a farmer and his family to move into a smaller house on the land in order to manage the crop. The farmer would teach him the tricks of the trade, though whether or not he would actually become a farmer himself or just be a wise overseer, he hadn't yet decided. Members of the sect had been making the place ready for weeks now, receiving items belonging to both Underwood and himself and installing them in readiness for their arrival. Flinch had been consulted on every stage of the preparations. He'd wanted to get it just right. After all, it was to be his home for what might turn out to be the rest of his life. He drove through the open gates and up the winding path to the house. Lights burned in most of the windows. Obviously his lordship was making himself comfortable. Flinch parked the car in front of the house and got out. The front door was ajar and he entered the candle-lit hallway. The tiled interior was cool and Bing Crosby's Aren't you glad your you drifted from deeper inside the house? Flinch smiled. Obviously the phonographic records had arrived intact. He walked towards the sound of the music and entered the lounge. The phonograph was playing, but there was no one in the room. He wandered through the house until he reached a small room, along the far wall of which hung an arras. A breeze played around the bottom of the curtain, and Flinch drew it aside to reveal a small flight of stairs that led up to a roof patio. He ascended and emerged to find Underwood, dressed in a fresh black suit, staring out across the dark expanse of countryside. "'Hello, Flinch,' he said without turning. "'Hello, sir. Is everything all right?' "'Everything's fine, Flinch.' just savouring the night for the last time. Listen to the crickets. There must be millions of them out there. Flinch joined him. Well, not exactly the last time, sir. Just the last time for a while. Underwood smiled. A very long while, Arthur. Fifty years is a lifetime for many people. It is, sir. Certainly it's the rest of my days. I sometimes wonder what kind of a world you'll be waking up to. Yes, yeah, so do I. The way the world's going these days, mankind will either be flying rocket ships to Venus or... Well, it won't be here at all, eh? Flinch nodded. Yes, sir. Nuclear war is indeed a, a frightening thing. Hmm, insane, isn't it? Underwood sighed. I'm tired, Arthur. These last two wars have been so bloody awful. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy a good war. In war, vampires are the last thing on anybody's mind, and the feeding is out of this world, as you know. But oh, things just seem to be getting out of hand, you know? And now, what with the bomb and all this bloody race to build ever bigger, ever nastier versions of it, I mean, well, that's not war, is it? War's a rotten business, certainly, but it has its good side. Besides bringing out the worst in men, it can often bring out the best in them, too. Courage, honour, camaraderie. But nuclear war? That'll be the end of everything, I fear. Yes, sir, we do seem to be heading into a very dark time. Yes, and I just don't want to be here when it happens, Arthur. The human race isn't just my favourite tipple, you know. It's very dear to my heart in many ways. I mean, I used to be part of it. Flinch nodded. He reached into his jacket pocket and took out his cigarettes. 
Perhaps a fag would cheer you up, sir. Underwood took one and accepted a light. Thanks. He exhaled the smoke in a sigh. I've grown tired of death as well. I used to be able to respect what I did, you know. I saw myself as part of nature's design. A leveller. A harvester of a crop that needed to be contained, lest it grow out of control, you know? Well, one could argue that it has grown out of control, sir. The population of the world isn't exactly dwindling. No, I realise that. But the A-bomb, the H-bomb, and whatever other lettered bomb they might be working on at the moment, they'll take care of the population in an instant, do the work of a billion vampires overnight. Yes, sir, you're not wrong there, unfortunately. I think we all question the meaning of our existence from time to time, sir. What am I here for, we ask ourselves. What does it all mean? Any ideas, Flinch? Not really, sir. Life is just being here and trying to make the best of it before they finally do drop the bomb. Underwood smiled. Yes, yes, of course it is. Still, I do know what I'm here for, and my reason, as I see it, my purpose, is about to lie down and, as you say, die for fifty years. I'm leaving you at sixes and sevens with your raison d'etre, am I, Arthur? Flinch looked away over the balcony. No, sir, I shall continue to serve you. My duties may be about to change, but you'll still need me, even if it's just to polish the silverware. Underwood smiled. Thank you, Arthur. He laid a hand on Flinch's shoulder and looked to the east where the night was beginning to blue at the horizon. Ah, look, the morn in russet mantle clad walks upon the eastern thingamabob. He dropped his cigarette and ground it out underfoot. Come on, old chap, we have work to do. I've already been down to check on the crypt and everything's been done to order. All we need do is get on with it. They went downstairs and through the house until they came to a room that had been designated as the library. Whatever this room had once been when it was a farmhouse had been thoroughly scrubbed away. Packing crates filled with books were piled up everywhere, and the walls were lined with bookcases waiting to be filled. Do you plan on spending much time in here, Arthur? I imagine I'll spend a good deal of time here, sir. Books will probably be my primary source of entertainment. Did you speak with Senor Largo about getting a television? I did, sir, but decided against it. No doubt it will just be what General Franco and his chums want to say, but I've no interest in listening to any of that nonsense. Not that you could understand it anyway, eh? <laughs> Underwood walked to one of the bookcases. It was the only one with a book in it. Underwood picked up the book. It was a paperback copy of Dracula. He handed it to Flinch. Oh, a, a cunning marker, by the way. Flinch smiled. <laughs> I had Senor Largo and his people mark the spot with what I felt was an apt title. Yes, I must say it made me chuckle, but not as much as this. The book had been lying against the concealed switch. Underwood pressed it and there was a click. He stepped back and took hold of the edge of the bookcase. It was hinged, and he swung it slowly open to reveal a staircase that led down to dim candlelight. Bravo, Flinch. Uh, merely following your instructions, sir. Yes, but still, <laughs> it's terrific fun, isn't it? Shall we close it up again, and then you can have a go? Flinch looked at his watch. I really think uh, we should be getting on, sir. I could have plenty of goes in the future. Yes. A flicker of regret played at the edges of Underwood's eyes. Yes, uh, I'm sure you shall. Oh, well, uh, let's be getting on, then. He stepped into the secret passage beyond the bookcase. Flinch followed. The stairs ran down the side of the wall into the cellar. Candelabras had been set into the walls at regular intervals, and now all blazed with light as Underwood and Flinch walked to the oak coffin 
that sat on a low stone plinth in the centre of the floor. Lovely job down here too, Arthur. Still, a bit musty, though. You'll need to air it fairly regularly. Yes, sir. Underwood laid a hand on the coffin lid and stroked the polished surface. Then he turned to flinch. So, er, uh, about the resurrection procedure, you're all clear on what to do? Absolutely, sir. Everything will be done according to your specifications. Now, I don't want a big fuss. None of that Dennis Wheatley nonsense. No, sir. I shall pass on your instructions in this and all things to the letter. At this, Flinch's voice caught. He cleared his throat and smiled. Underwood patted his shoulder. Don't worry, old friend. I'll be fine. I've done this many times before. It's it's not that, sir. I know that. It, it, it's just... Well, this is goodbye, isn't it? A tear ran down his face. Underwood smiled. Yes, Arthur, I, I suppose it is. He extended his hand. Thank you for everything. You're a credit to your family name. And when I look in your eyes, I can see your father, his father, and all of their fathers going back over the centuries to dear old Matthias. You've all been my friends and most trusted servants, and I shall always be thankful to you all. You've done them proud, Arthur. Thank you, sir. Flinch took out his handkerchief to dry his eyes. Thank you. Very much. He took Underwood's hand and shook it. All right, then. Underwood tapped the coffin lid. It's that time, I'm afraid. Oh, just one thing, sir. Flinch reached into his pocket and took out Underwood's watch. Will you be wanting this with you in your uh, repose? Underwood smiled. No, I think it's best if you hang on to that. Keep it wound for me, would you? Of course, sir. I shall wind it every evening at sundown, just as I always do. Capital. Underwood turned and opened the coffin, lifting off the heavy lid as if it were made of cardboard and not of fine Spanish oak. Hmm, nothing like the smell of a new coffin, eh, Flinch? He set the lid down against a nearby pillar. Flinch smiled. No, sir. Underwood got inside and settled himself down. Oh, very nice. Just my size. Flinch wrung his hands. Are you absolutely sure about this, sir? Yes, Flinch. Everything needs to die once in a while, even if it isn't a real death. Just hibernation, sir. Precisely. Just hibernation, Flinch. Flinch nodded sadly and picked up the coffin lid. He laid it carefully onto the coffin and slid it up into position, stopping short of Underwood's face. May I just say, sir, just how much of a pleasure it's been to serve you? Thank you, Flinch. And may I say that the pleasure has been entirely mutual. Flinch laughed and wiped a tear from his eye. Goodbye, master. Goodbye, Flinch. Enjoy your retirement. Thank you, sir. I shall, sir. Underwood crossed his hands over his chest and closed his eyes. Then Flinch slid the coffin lid over the face of his master and let it fall into place with a dry, heavy sound of finality. He drew his palm slowly and silently over the smooth surface of the coffin. Rest well. He turned and walked to the nearest candelabra, where he blew out the candles one by one. He continued this process slowly around the cellar until he came to the stairs leading back up to the library. There 
he snuffed out the last light and slowly ascended the stairs towards the dim glow of a new dawn. Thank you for listening to Underwood and Flinch. More episodes will be added to this YouTube channel soon. To download the entire audiobook for free right now, go to www.underwoodandflinch.com or search for it on iTunes. Thank you.